and welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. A very special guest, Father Mitch Pacwa, SJ, is here to talk about his new book, The Eucharist, a Bible study guide for Catholics, published by our Sunday visitor. Welcome, Father Mitch. Doug, thank you for a having me. A prolific writer, show. prolific speaker, a TV show host, <laughs> radio host. You know, when you find it, now you, it seems, you seems like you've gotten started in this mode mm -hmm. of doing Bible studies. Mm -hmm. Is it because it's something you're comfortable with? It's something you like to do? It, or, or your publisher has found that it's popular? My publisher has found that it's popular. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> and they, Straight shooter, yeah, right? They, they ask me to do these Bible studies. They asked me to do it for the year of St. Paul. I remember so that, So I did right? two of them for right. the year of St. Paul. Uh, one on St. Paul and the sacraments, one on his, uh, his teachings on salvation, mm -hmm. the cross. Um, and those did well for our Sunday visitor. So they asked me to do one on the year of faith. Which we did on we, the show. We, we right. did that on the right. show. And it's been a big seller for religious catalog as well. Oh, yeah. Right. It's, it's the best uh, seller of any books I've written. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's over 60,000 copies. Mm -hmm. Uh, still Which is a lot of copies, especially for a Catholic, Catholic market, program. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I attribute that to Pope Benedict having grabbed the imagination of the Catholic world on this year of faith. They recognize there's something wrong with the world, mm -hmm. and we need to get back to our roots and our faith. And so I did the Bible study for that. Well, one element of that book that I drew from Pope Benedict's, uh, you know, opening of the year of faith, is for us to return to the Eucharist mm -hmm. and get back to the Eucharist as something of, uh, from the perspective of faith, uh, manifesting our faith, but also calling us to deeper faith in the person of Christ, because his theme for the year of faith is to meet Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one component of that other book chapter was on the Eucharist. Eucharist. And uh, the, our Sunday visitor asked me to do a Bible study just on the Eucharist. So when you say the Eucharist, mm -hmm. do you mean the Mass? Do you mean the sacrifice at the Mass? Do you mean uh, the, the communion host with our Lord? Did you receive a communion? What do you mean when you say the Eucharist? The, all the above. Okay, okay. <laughs> and, um, and, and this is uh, one of the most uh, uh, important parts of this book is uh, by being a Bible study. What I'm trying to do is get back to the scriptural hmm. roots of understanding Mass. We have gone through a period in which a lot of people, it's, it shows up not only in uh, some ideas, but in church architecture, where the focus is on us as a community, and Mass is primarily about a community experience. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, many churches were designed in the 70s and later so that the congregation faces each other. Right, almost a little more in the round. Right, kind of right. Semicircle. Uh, and uh, so that we can be part of the community. Mm -hmm. And then you look at so many of the hymns mm -hmm. reflecting this idea that Mass is about the community. Mm -hmm. We are the light of the world. We gather us in. We're here. Right. God, do you realize how lucky you are to have us That's here? Right. I, We're I, talking I, about us now. I, I, me, yeah, me. Exactly. Yeah, right. And okay. us. You know, yeah, and so, right. um, uh, and it describes, and it says, stop. You know, the center of the Eucharist is Jesus Christ. We don't become a community except in Him. The church is not the body of Christ if it is not united with Christ the head. Well, you talk about that kind of community experience because, again, uh, maybe more of the 70s, 80s kind of thing. A lot of yes. you started to get Eucharist as being, well, when we get together, we're Eucharist. Ex we're part of the Thanksgiving kind of a thing. I've had people come right. up to me at Holy Communion. I'll say, the body of Christ. I say, yes, I yeah, am. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't expect me to genuflect to you. <laughs> Unlike it. To, and people said that. Why did you genuflect to the tabernacle? You don't genuflect to the people? I said, that's right, because I've never met a tabernacle who will be tempted to a sin of pride by having me genuflect to it. Mm -hmm. People, yes, 
<laughs> ask the kings and emperors of the world. Mm. So this is something that you know we want to uh, get back to the biblical issue of the sacrifice. And I do this from a number of perspectives in this Bible study. Uh, one element is certainly to go back to the words of the institution at the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. And you know what, again, most, Catholic, most people in general, Catholic or Protestant, cannot see is that these are sacrificial terms mm -hmm. that Jesus is using. And the reason is that, that you know you don't know Hebrew. Right, and that's what you talk about in the exactly. book, right, in, in understanding exactly. what is it, the word to do or... Yes, and, exactly. Right, right, right. That the word, uh, uh, there, there are two words used for offering sacrifice. One is zavach, which is the normal word for animal sacrifices, uh, because it also means to slaughter. And in Arabic, for instance, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the cognate word tabakh also means to cook. So there's this sense of this being a, a, a meal kind of experience on that slaughter. But in many passages, it says to do them. Mm -hmm. Now in English, you'll see that the translators correctly translate it as sacrifice mm -hmm. or offer. But Hebrew actually will say uh, asa, you know, do. Or, and, and in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. they use the Greek word do, poyen, mm -hmm. or in its various forms, depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. And what's most interesting is that this is true in describing the sacrifice of the Passover lamb and of non-animal sacrifices. So when you offer bread, oil, wine, grain, flour, things like that. You do them because you can't slaughter them. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make sense. And so when Christ says do this, he is making the point he's a non-animal sacrifice and he is the Passover lamb mm -hmm. and that you do this and then in remembrance of me, that word remembrance, I go through its uses. It's one time used in the uh, Book of Wisdom, which is probably first century BC, written in Alexandria, Egypt, not in the Holy Land. It's not unlike first Maccabees or Sirach. It is not a translation of a Hebrew text, mm -hmm. but it's written in Greek. That's why Jewish people don't include it in their canon, right. but Christians have mm -hmm. uh, since the beginning of the church. And in there, it uses the word memory simply as recalling the past. And that, but that's the only time it's used that way in the Bible. All the other uses refer to a memorial sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I give those passages for people to look right. up. Right. Well, you clearly, I mean, it seems like a, uh, a big part of what you're doing is to, show, is to not only cite the New Testament, but to really get the foreshadowing and connect the Old Testament to the New Testament exactly. to reinforce the foundation, right? Exactly. Well, and, and here's what's important. We have to remember that Jesus and the apostles and the crowds were Jewish. Mm -hmm. We see throughout the New Testament, Jesus is circumcised, presented in the temple. His family celebrates Passover every year, as was their custom. The, uh, you see it in the Gospel of John, three Passovers are mentioned. He goes for the Feast of Tabernacles, he's there for Hanukkah, and so on. Mm -hmm. So he, he is Jewish. And this Jewish background, including the language background, the linguistic background, is part of whom he chose to be. He didn't just sort of happen to be born a Jew. Mm -hmm. From all eternity, he chose the people of Israel and chose to be born in their midst and draw on this whole background and pull it together in the New Testament. Do you have any idea in your mind in all the reading you've done and the studies of the Hebrew Scriptures of why He chose the Jews? You know, it's, um, th th there's, uh, it, it, it is uh, something mysterious, frankly. I can't even tell you why he chose me to be a priest, <laughs> okay. yet alone chose the Jews to be the chosen people. Right, right. Um, you know, this is a mystery. Um, you know, uh, 
And the one thing I do think is that the, the, the Israelite people have a genius for being radically honest about themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, I read a lot of uh, the literature of Egypt and Assyria and all these other places mm -hmm. too, uh, that's part of what we do, mm -hmm. but nobody tells the truth about their great heroes also being big sinners, mm -hmm. the way Israel does. And it understands that they are subject to the Lord God and His law. And if I would have chosen uh, any reason, that would be mm -hmm. a primary one. They had this ability to accept faith in God and judge even their greatest heroes mm -hmm. by the norms God sets in His commandments. And as such, you know, he, he calls them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's why I tell people being in the Bible would be a horrible thing because not only would your sins be written down, but people would be reading it mm -hmm. and calling it scripture mm -hmm. for the next thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Who wants that? I'm uncomfortable enough going to a confessional where they can't talk about my sins. Right. Let <laughs> right. alone put in the Bible. But it's uh, it, it, there's something else too about the chosen land, the, the promised land. Mm -hmm. This is the land bridge between Asia, Europe, and Africa, and it was the perfect place from which to spread. To go and evangelize and spread the, the this good yeah. news that there's only one God. Right. And his Messiah comes right. from. In the introduction, you say, in this book, we want to examine Jesus' teaching and actions concerning the Eucharist as found in the New Testament, as illuminated by the Old Testament and Jewish practice, is what you're talking about. Well, let me ask you you say, in the Old Testament, sacrifice was offered by the Levitical priests. In the New Testament, Jesus is the one true eternal high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, I remember one day I woke up and things went around Vatican II, and suddenly some guy showed up named Melchizedek, who I'd never heard before. Who is he? All right, Melchizedek <laughs> is, you've got to read your Holy Bible. Um, Melchizedek appears uh, twice in the Old Testament. Uh, once in Genesis 14, where he is the king of the city of Salem, which is obviously Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he uh, meets Abram, and after Abram defeats some enemies, Khadr Laomer and others from Syria. And Abram gives him a tithe, a tenth of all the war booty. And Melchizedek offers bread and wine to El Elyon, God Most High. Mm -hmm. So he's a priest of the one true God, and he offers bread and wine, obviously already looking toward the mm -hmm. Eucharist. Right. Secondly, he appears in Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is a messianic psalm. And it says, the Lord said to my Lord, referring, David refers to the Messiah as his Lord. Mm -hmm. And says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool under your feet. And this psalm about the Messiah includes in verse four, saying to the Messiah, you are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And this was a problem for, for Jewish readers. The priests come from the tribe of Levi. David comes from the tribe of Judah. And so, for instance, the Essenes at the Dead Sea thought, well, there's going to be two messiahs. One will be a Melchizedek priest, one will be the Davidic king. What Hebrews makes clear is that Jesus Christ is that Messiah, that line applies to him, not to somebody else, mm -hmm. not to another messianic character, but to the one Messiah who is the son of David and a priest according to Melchizedek. And one of the things I show here is that Melchizedek's priesthood is superior mm -hmm. because Abram, with all of his genetic, uh, his family, his descendants genetically present in him, offer Melchizedek a tithe, which is a recognition of his priesthood, so that Hebrews argues even the tribe of Levi is offering sacrifice through Melchizedek. And therefore, 
all of Israel and all the world looks to Jesus, the priest according to the Mel uh, of Melchizedek, as superior to all the high priests of Levi and any other priest that exists in the universe, and that he is the one who offers not things s distinct from himself, but he is also the Lamb of God who offers himself. So, and this makes his priesthood superior. Uh, that he's yeah. offering himself. He's victim and priest. Well, later on, one of the things that struck me was the he goat, that it was a he goat that mm -hmm. was sacrificed. Yes. And you make that point, why? When on Yom Kippur, because I, I, I try to draw a number of links mm -hmm. between the Eucharist and Yom Kippur. Yeah. yeah some of, yeah. again, most folks don't read the Mishnah, mm -hmm. so they'll miss it. What is the Mishnah? Mishnah you talk is, about that yeah, as well. Right. right. Mishnah is a collection of rabbinic teachings that are not in the Bible, but explain the Bible. For instance, uh, in uh, one of the tractates called Yoma, which is about the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, um, uh, it's a lot of it's written in Aramaic, mm -hmm. that's what's called Yoma, mm -hmm. that's the Aramaic word for Yom, day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in there, uh, it describes the Day of Atonement. And one part of it was, two goats were chosen, as Leviticus says to do. Uh, and one was for the Lord, one was for Azazel. Azazel is a demon from the yeah, desert. Yeah, I, I was surprised by that, reading that. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And that's, again, that's in Leviticus. And, of course, the Mishnah is faithful to Leviticus. Mm -hmm. And uh, the priest would place his hands on one hand on each goat, and they would choose by lot which one was for the Lord, which one was one for Azazel. The one for the Lord uh, he would uh, offer as a sacrifice, and it goes by the way, it had to be uh, equal in age, size, and so on, value. Um, and he would take that goat for the Lord and sacrifice it. And uh, the blood would be collected in a, a bowl. And he also, and prior to that, the priest also killed the bull mm -hmm. for his own sins. The goat was for the sins of the whole nation. Okay. Interesting. He had a bull for himself mm -hmm. and a much smaller goat for the nation. Very, I mean, that's, that's something else to reflect on. But mm -hmm. at any rate, he uh, then takes that blood and sprinkles it in the Holy of Holies. And uh, he had to uh, you know, sprinkle it up and down. Well, when Christ is on trial before uh, Pilate, again, when you don't know Aramaic, you miss this. But who were the choices that Pilate gave? Mm -hmm. Jesus or? Barabbas. And Barabbas in Aramaic means son of the father. Oh, really? Okay. Right. Abba. You know mm -hmm. the word Abba, right? right. right? Mm -hmm. So Bar Abba means son of the Father. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus is the son of God the Father. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus is parallel to the goat for the Lord. Mm -hmm. And Barabbas is the one who's let go. Because the goat for Azazel was let go into the wilderness where he died. Right. But Now, was that technically the scapegoat? or is that That's different? the scapegoat. He escaped right. being the sacrifice. But don't they end up... Throwing them off the ridge they throw them off, off a, a cliff, cliff or exactly. something anyway. Right. Uh, so here you have the the goat for for the Lord, the one for uh, Azazel, and Barabbas and Jesus both are son of the Father, but you know different fathers, mm -hmm. and That's that parallelism, mm -hmm. right. you know, the people choose, you know, the scapegoat, no, the, the the goat of sacrifice for the Lord. Mm -hmm. And let the scapegoat okay. get, go off. Well, it's interesting because there's a couple others that relate to that. Uh, you talk about in Yom Kippur the idea that the high priest had to swear oath not to change a single component of the liturgy. Yes. And then similarly, a Catholic priest may not change the liturgy, so it's not his mass, which has been a big issue for a lot of people Absolutely. over the years. You also, this was another one that I thought was interesting. Another parallel to Gethsemane is found in Yom Kippur yes. practice, having the younger priest stay up all night with the high priest to prevent him from falling asleep. Right. You know, the, on the, the night before, Yom Kippur, the high priest stayed up all night. They were afraid that he might have a nocturnal emission and pollute himself, and then he couldn't offer the sacrifice. Oh, okay. That was the issue. So keep him awake all night. And the young priests, you know, being younger, could do that. But with Christ in Gethsemane, he's the one who tries to keep the priests awake. He just ordained the apostles. 
They're his new priests. And they're not trying to keep him awake. He's trying to keep them awake to watch with him. Mm -hmm. And that his time in the Garden of Gethsemane is parallel. But instead of just trying to stay awake so he doesn't fall into some sort of you know, ritual impurity, Jesus is contemplating his suffering and the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. And this is extremely important because an aspect of the Mass and of the priesthood is that we have to have a concern for the sins of the world mm -hmm. so that there is a, a, a conversion, a transformation, a forgiveness, and a healing of the effects of sin. And the Mass is going to be part of that. Christ contemplates the world as part of that vigil. And he wants us to stay awake and watch with him for at least an hour. You know, so this Archbishop Sheen always referred to this passage as a, 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 a reason to have a holy hour, especially for the priests, but for everybody. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Now, let me just talk about the structure of the Bible study itself. Now, this is, I am assuming, a standard structure that they've been using and they consider an interactive Bible study to talk about how long a study guide, a Bible, a notebook you need. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and, and how you work through it. So it, it's all laid out here, the yes. introduction. Uh, and I'm assuming you, you basically wrote to the format or you gave yes. them the, the structure right. uh, was given to you and, and right. then you kind of rolled through all of these things. Uh, and, and it also indicates, I think, at the beginning of this, this is the kind of thing that you could use in a group or you could use by yourself, right? Exactly. Exactly. Anybody can use this on their own with their families or friends or in a, a people I know are using it at, in Bible study groups nice. uh, and parishes. And this is a great way to prepare for Holy Week. You know, so that, mm -hmm. um, and let me just mention one other element of here that's uh, uh, part of my purpose in doing this. A lot of non-Catholics will look to uh, Hebrews like we do and say, well, it says Jesus' sacrifice is once and for all. Mm -hmm. Why do you kill Jesus again and again? Right, right. And part of understanding the Bible study is to show we don't crucify Christ again and again. The Mass is not a different sacrifice than Calvary. It is the one sacrifice of Calvary that is made present, what is eternally present in heaven, becomes present on the altar, and that this is also something I want people to reflect on in the Mass. In session two, you also, in a sense, are, are reinforcing the idea that sometimes it's been lost inside the church itself, that it actually is a sacrifice. You tell a story mm -hmm. about a particular, uh, what, a seminarian. Yes. Uh, where you challenged him on the, uh, the words, the ignorance becomes so widespread that one time in a conversation with a very well-educated seminary, I surprised him by pointing out that each of the four primary Eucharistic prayers of the Roman Rite explicitly mentioned the word sacrifice in the prayer. Yes. Because he didn't think they were there. He, 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 he was critical criticizing something I had actually said in a homily uh, at, in the community. And, he, you know, I said, why are you talking about Mass as a sacrifice? This, you know, that's not in Vatican II. I said, I said, look at every Eucharistic prayer. It's all you know, there. I said, no, it's not. Nice. You know, and he'd been hearing Mass, you know, for years. Mm -hmm. You know, his whole, he, was a, uh, he wasn't a young man. He was, you know, more mature. And, um, and because of a poor formation that was part of what was going on throughout the church. Right. The word sacrifice was filtered out. The idea of offering a sacrifice, again, the Came emphasis more of a, on, on, the me on community. And the meal, kind yeah, of the, the community me meal. Right. right, all that was. Right, now, let me just ask you before we go, who's Neil Fisher and what did he teach you? Neil Fisher owns a, is a rancher in Texas and he taught me to hunt. Uh -huh. And he lets me come so back. So we can blame him, huh? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm thanking him. <laughs> well, Neil and his wife are fantastic folks and they're two well, sons and daughters-in-law. Well, this book will hunt, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Father Thanks. Mitch. Always great to have you here talking with the one and only Father Mitch Pacwa about his Bible study, The Eucharist, a Bible study guide for Catholics, published by OSV, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Check it out. Check us out next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark.